So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much for coming to this session of the seminar series uh, by the Department of Educational Research at Lancaster University. Before we start, as ever, thanks to our growing community of speakers and to our growing community of audience members uh, who actively contribute so well. We're indebted to Dee and to Rebecca, of course, making all of this work behind the scenes. We use the seminar series to strengthen the themes of our uh, research centres to contribute globally to educational research and we welcome and encourage a diverse global audience of friends and colleagues to attend and to take part in post presentation discussions so please do feel free to spread the word and please feel free to uh, follow up on social media um, on your various channels if you're not already doing so. Today we're joined by Rob Miles Rob Miles is a researcher who is incredibly active, a renowned change laboratory in educational research. Thanks to the efforts of people like Rob, there, there is a growing community in the orbit of the Department of Educational Research who specialise in formative interventions. Rob Miles is an alumnus of the department. He completed his PhD in 2021, addressing issues in uh, laptop mediated English language classrooms. He's an English language professional who's worked in the UK, Greece, Spain, Italy and Brazil, now based in the United Arab Emirates, where it's, I think it's fair to say most of Rob's efforts are currently in teaching as well as in research. Rob's research interests include activity theory, expansive learning, language acquisition, classroom technology, educational leadership, uh, as well as an increase in interest in online assessment and English language. Thank you, Rob, very much for taking the time to engage with us. Uh, much appreciated. Welcome to the departmental seminar series. Hope you enjoy it as much as I know we all will um, enjoy and see you in 45 minutes or so. Hey, well, thanks for the uh, wonderful introduction. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll crack on. Um, so I can skip over my introduction as you've done that so well, and I'll go straight into my context. Um, Basically, as you mentioned, I'm in the UAE and I'm working for one of the, well, the largest federal university. Now, degrees here are largely taught in English. And that means, of course, there's an English requirement. Same as there is in any UK university or any university teaching in English. If that requirement isn't met, students are going into a program that's called Foundations, which for those of you working in the UK system is kind of like a, a pre-sessional course that students would have to pass um, and meet you know, an equivalency of IELTS or another exam to get through. Now, <clears throat> this course over the years has been very high stakes and, and high profile. <clears throat> Universities obviously need students and they use you know, pre-sessionals of feeding students into courses. Now, technology was seen as you know, the answer to, to this, you know, to make, making this course more successful. Um, now, being the UAE, um, they're really not af afraid to throw money at, at what they, they think is a, a problem. So we've had since 2010 um, laptops in classrooms, which came along with various iterations of interactive smart boards. In 2012, there was an iPad initiative, and that saw 14,000 students across the country. Basically, the whole of that year's intake were given iPads. And we were told in April, and it happened in the August and we had to go completely paperless. So that was a challenge and a big learning curve. We've got um, very well managed learning management systems. All assessments are online um, throughout the year and hours and hours. And I've stressed the second part of the hours because it's at least 40 hours for academic year. But people are pushing 60 or 70 of compulsory professional development. Um, and there's a wealth of interactive materials. So, I mean, sounds great, right? Um, well, no, the thing was, despite all of these interventions, results were largely static. And if you actually looked at it carefully, as I did, um, at the risk of making myself very unpopular, fewer students were actually actually passing than had been doing before. We, we had all this technology, we had all this training, all this fantastic brand new material but we were closing the door on a lot of students before their academic journey had even started we were advertising a 70 percent pass rate but that was seriously massaged and i think if you looked into it it was going as low as 40 percent on some campuses and i'm sure 
you know, for a university where you've got perhaps at the time 60% of the students were coming into this foundation course, this pre-sessional, were only 40% to then be getting out the other end, um, was, was, you know, disappointing to say the, the least. So top-down interventions hadn't worked. We'd had like the, the laptops, the iPads, the compulsory training, everything like that. We had great teachers, no doubt about that. You know, who were dedicated, who were putting in the hours of the training, trying out new things. So once I got round to, you know, in a position where I was doing my PhD and I was looking for a project, I thought, well, this is this is a, a big um, this is a big yes for me. So, but why don't we get solutions from the front line rather than top down? You know, what do the teachers on the front line and, and where possible the students? What what do they see as the root of the problem? Now, of course, it was how to dis how to guide this discovery, and this is where activity theory comes in. Now, I'm, I'm aware there are some very um, prominent activity theorists in the room, so I'm quite scared of doing this. So, to distract everyone, this is the only bit with some animations in it. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go through this very briefly in case there is anyone here um, who's who doesn't know about activity theory. All human activity basically is is social. You have a subject that could be an individual, that could be um, a group of people, it could be an organization, and they have an object, something they're trying to achieve. That could be something, let's say something so quite basic, like catching a fish, it could be building a house, it could be passing lots of students from your college, for example. Now that, achieving that object is med mediated by tools or artifacts. Now these could be physical, something like you know an actual tool like a hammer, they could be um, an idea or concept, and they can even be another person, um, a more knowledgeable other. Now the subject, of course, is part of a community, and the, the community and the subject, they're mediated by the rules, basically what you can and can't do. The relationship between the community and the object is then mediated by division of labor. This is kind of who does what. So if you think like in a teaching context, um, the subject might be the teachers who have the object of you know, passing that knowledge onto the students. Um, they're using whatever materials, in our case, lots and lots of technology, laptops, smart boards, interactive materials, online assessments. There are rules governing this. We're part of a wider community of students, teachers, parents, the community at large. And there's a division of labor over who's expected to do what in the classroom. Now, all of this activity then has an intended outcome. In my particular case, get the students into their academic courses. There's unintended outcomes. Again, in my particular case, this was students failing. Now, when you have in unintended outcomes, it means that there are contradictions. Okay, there's, I put in too many of these, I apologize. But uh, a contradiction is basically when there's a problem in or between elements of the activity system. And this could be causing the unintended outcomes. In my case, failure, attrition, and students not moving on into their programs. Now, for those of you that don't know, activity theory comes out of Marx. And this is a very favorite um, quote of mine that apparently I overused in the first draft of my thesis, but still. Um, Activity theory allows us to describe what's happening um, on one level. But as Marx says, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. And the point is to change it. But activity theory also gives us the, the opportunity to do that through a thing that's called expansive learning. Now, expansive learning is basically what a change laboratory tries to put into practice. It's a bottom-up process. It's rooted in theory. And it uses mirror data. So it takes, for example, the problem and it gives this to a group of practitioners, in my case, teachers, and they then use the theory, activity theory, to try to find solutions to this problem. And the aim is to reach solutions to real workplace problems. It goes through seven stages. Now, if any of you out there are thinking that you need a big project, something to really get your teeth into, make you ignore family, friends, hobbies, and everything else for a considerable amount of time, then I can really recommend a change laboratory. It's a massive undertaking and a massive amount of work. But it goes through very clear stages. Um, you're gonna 
recognize the need for change is the first thing. And, you know, looking at the pass rates in my situation, um, that was obvious. You look at the historicity of the history of what you're doing. So how did you work in the past? What contradictions, what issues is that causing in the present? You then create a new model. You try this new model out and then you come back and you try it again until it starts to become into a concrete practice. And then the final stages of this are spreading it wider, moving it from your own sort of limited context into a wider context. So we carried all this out and I'm, I won't read this you through this diagram, but this is the situation we ended up um, towards the end of my change lab. We'd identified all the historical dilemmas and contradictions and conflicts with, that were manifesting as current contradictions. And as you can see, it's, it's a complex diagram. There, there was a lot going on. Um, that we'd identified. You know, really we found what we boiled it down to that we had 15 historical contradictions, hist 15 issues worth mentioning. And these were feeding into 15 current contradictions, potentially causing this, the problems of attrition and failure. Now these went into four key areas. There was issues with the tools, which is what I'm gonna talk about a bit today. There were issues with the objects of the course, issues with the subject, and issues with neighboring activity systems. So we were in a very good place to then move on. Um, we were looking at some potential some solutions and we thought we'd, uh, we had some great ideas in place. Um, we'd worked on a future model. Um, we were all very excited about moving ahead with this. Um, as you can see here, we had ideas about teacher training, about students, um, about how we could improve relationships with management and how we, essentially the whole point of this was increased student success. Then of course COVID-19 hit, thank you very much. And there we go, back to online, off to online teaching, um, social distancing. This was a, you know, a fairly massive contradiction and it, it kind of stopped me in my tracks in terms of really following up on the on the change laboratory i've got to the stage where i was able to report enough and you know that that was my thesis for my for my phd but i was very excited about moving ahead with it and obviously had to wait a bit until things have changed now things have changed and we're back the uae was very very strict as well i think more so than perhaps the uk and it took a long time for a lot of the rules over social distancing for example to relax and you know, mask wearing, et cetera. So it's only really been recently, I mean, perhaps even this year that I myself and teachers and students have been more comfortable to start thinking about looking at some of the solutions that we've proposed. So one of the issues that we were dealing with, one of the contradictions we were facing was this idea that interactive materials were better. That, you know, there, there was no place for paper, there was no place for static documents, that we should be, you know, for one of a better expression, all bells and whistles. Um, you know, we had a wealth of platforms available. There was um, things like Kahoot, I don't know if you're familiar with it, Quizzes, Quizlet, Book Quidgets, Nearpod. And I was seeing everybody was, you know, using these these quite a lot, um, to say, say the least, uh, making good use of it. And this is where I thought I might, um, if you don't mind, We'll play a little game. Could I ask, you could use your mobiles if it actually loads. Could I ask that you uh, just uh, put that into your mobile when I share the screen again, of course. There's a code at the top. If you just go to kahoot.it, and then you type in the game code, put in your name, and you should be able to come in. It doesn't have to be your real name. Use another tab on your computer. Hey, thank you, welcome. All 
Okay, I think we've probably got enough of us there just to start and get an idea of it. So, just three questions. Ah, so interestingly, only one person knew that. There were seven Emirates in the UAE. Um, I won't list them for you because I might miss one out. Let's try the next question. There's only three questions, so it's pretty quick. And well done, James, there for being the one person that knew that. Yeah, I think I've got all the answers there. False, yes, again. Okay, so we did pretty well with that. And then uh, James is still at the top. And last question, I promise you. Okay, I'll just skip that ahead so we can get to the answer. The answer, of course, was Arabic. And then we get a podium in third place. Brett, well done, Brett. Second place, Johnny. And then in first place, I'm guessing James, well done. Okay, so I shall stop that and turn it off. Okay, that was just an example of one of the sort of uh, platforms that teachers here were using. And I think, you know, yeah, that's a bit of fun and um, seems very engaging. Um, however, the issue is that what we identified was something that I've called app fatigue, which is basically familiar familiarity breeds content. And I'm sure you could hear the music. And uh, this is a quote from one of the participants um, in my change laboratory was, oh, it does drive you mad, doesn't it, about that background music. And I think what they were getting at is the first time you, you, know, you, you play Kahoot with students or as a, even as a teacher, you think, oh, this is great. You're forgetting that that student might see two or three teachers a day. And then if every single one of those teachers is using that app, it ceases to be um, interesting for them. And all of a sudden, um, students stop engaging. Um, I know in my own case, the students just started shouting the answers out um, or shouting out the wrong answers, to try and distract their friends, which they found quite hilarious. And it, it, as I say, it really does. Um, we've noticed that with a lot of these platforms, if you don't mix it up, um, it, it um, ceases to have um, the same engaging effects. Um, with this manifested as a, as a secondary contradiction. There is also an element of obviously of gamification to this, you know, like being first, being the winner. Um, and that I also think started to manifest in, in other platforms that are not necessarily aimed at producing winners, but it, it started a thing that I then called the halas mentality. Now, I don't really speak very much menta um, <laughs> mentality, much Arabic, but um, halas means finished. And I soon learned it because um, students are basically racing to finish interactive activities. It's, as this again, a quote from one of my participants, was it, if it's multiple choice, if it's some kind of um, something where they've got to click and get the, the correct answers, they're just clicking until it says correct. They're not actually engaging at all with the material. So, I mean, this is a, an example. I don't know if you can see that clearly. It's the same exercise on the left and what, students will do is open an, uh, an exercise like this in two windows. In one of the windows, they'll press the check answers button. And in the other one, they just put all the answers correct. So all they're doing is looking for a hack or a way around um, the answer. And all you hear from the students again is this halas, finished very, very quickly. Um, this particular reading here, I think is, you know, probably getting on for four or 500 words. And you'd get students answering in literally seconds or at best a minute. 
um, it's obviously not engaging. So this is obviously an issue, but then what becomes a solution to that? Well, one solution I already mentioned is to mix it up a bit. Don't overuse something, try out new things. Um, but we also found that we had quite a lot more success in our context with simple documents. So something like this is a PDF that would be delivered via a learning management system. The students are gonna access it on their laptops but they have to interact with it in a similar way that they would act, interact with a normal handout. They've got questions, they've got text. You can ask them to find the answer within the text and highlight it. They can annotate on the document. It could be PDF, it could be Word. But this needed far more engagement on the part of the student. There was no way they could shout halas. Well, they still would shout halas at you because someone would WhatsApp them the answers from another group, perhaps. But they weren't able to do so in the same way that they are able to hack the games or race to finish without, you know, just taking multiple attempts in order to finish without engaging with the material. Now, in terms of the theory, this, I believe, goes back to the idea of, you know, having a more knowledgeable other as your tool. All of a sudden, the, the teacher is no longer redundant. I know there was a lot of that talk about you know, with technology, the, the teacher becomes the, the guide on the side rather than the sage on the stage. And I'm not saying we need to go back to this sort of I know everything teacher mode. But it does mean that the teacher has a role in the sense that they're releasing the answers, they're releasing the knowledge, they're guiding the students to finding those answers rather than just saying, well, keep clicking and eventually everything will turn green. Um, and this was, you know, a fairly common refrain amongst amongst the teachers. Once you you get over the excitement of having all of the the technology that we have here at our um, fingertips, then you you realise you need to actually start getting some meat into into what you're teaching. The other thing we looked at was um, using the different devices for different purposes, because obviously there's there's more than one device in that classroom. Now laptops are good. I'm a big fan. There's nothing wrong with them. They're great for producing work, um, obviously for, for writing on using the other applications, you know, the normal sort of Microsoft um, applications. They're great for researching. I'm sure everyone here knows. They're a very useful store. And most of all, they're the mediating tool between my materials are on a learning management system or share drive or however you might be doing it. The student is accessing those through a laptop and they're returning them to me often through that, that same laptop. Great. However, we have the ubiquitous mobile or the bleep, 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 bleep mobile, as I've had many um, colleagues describe it. And it's a source of considerable tension. I'm sure if any of you are in classroom teaching um, sort of environments, you might be in a situation where they just banned in the classroom. And, and great if, if that's the case, but we're a tertiary institution and that isn't something that we can really do with um we don't we don't just don't have the power of that and it caused uh, it was causing a massive problem in class as students were just literally sitting glued to their mobile phones they, we didn't have the rules um or the authority to effectively ban it although we'd try um, or some people would try um and again you're in this sort of conflict that in my class i might say yeah it's okay use your phone in another class of teachers um are trying to you know, prohibit the use. So it was causing contradictions all around. Now, the solution that we as a team felt was it's a second device. So use it as such. Banishment or prohibition, it's not the answer. You know, in a, in a language classroom, students can be using these for translation. There are lots of translation apps um, these days in particular. It can be a second screen. So if they're doing an exercise, you know, playing a game like a Kahoot, like I showed you, they could be answering on their mobile. You could have a text in front of them on the screen that they're reading from and answering questions that you're beaming up on the, on the smart board. This is engaging them with the device rather than just whatever they were doing before. Um, they can use it for note taking. Um, my students in particular use it for a lot of photos. You know, I do a lot of board work, um, which isn't very high tech. Um, but my students take lots and lots of photos of it. And they seem to find that a better way of, you know, taking down notes about steps for something. If I'm asked, if I'm telling them how to submit an assessment, for example, onto the learning management system, they'll video me going through the steps and then just use that. 
If I send them a video, they won't watch it. If I send them the steps, they don't read them. So I have to stand there and show them, but they'll film me doing it or take photos of me doing it. So if you find me on TikTok, that's where it came from. Voice notes can be very useful, of course, in sending each other voice notes, great for practicing speaking. Using them as timers, um, as clickers, essentially ask devices. Um, give them a task to do with their, with their mobile and you'll actually keep them more engaged, um, we believe. It's one way of trying to tackle the issue anyway. And I think, you know, just having a blanket ban on them in in any kind of education system these days is just is just unrealistic. Now the last one um, we found hard copy. Now it may not obviously there are issues with sustainability with this, but we found students get really really excited when you give them a handout these days. Something that they've got to do on paper. It's we've kind of gone full circle is, you know, I remember when I was first here, you know, almost 20 years ago, if we took them into a language lab or somewhere with computers to do a, you know, an ex some kind of very basic interactive exercise, they'd be really excited and engaged. We've actually been finding the same um, with hard copy within reason. Um, I prefer if students use their own notebooks, um, again, because this is more sustainable and there's a record of it, because if we give them something, then the the paper tends to go out, but we have a variety of exercises that we're using where we're getting students to almost create their own activities on paper, on their, um, on you know, in their notebooks, and then the, use these, of course, closing the laptops, asking them to turn their phones off and leave those face down on top of the laptop at the time. And we're getting, um, we're getting reasonable buy-in with this. Again, as long as we don't overdo it, I'm sure, you know, I mean, I've got. Um, some kids in their early 20s and it's an absolute nightmare for them if they don't have a phone with them 24 7 um, it's the same with my students but again if you can get 20 to 25 minutes a, a just you know on a notebook on a piece of paper we're finding that's quite engaging for them now the last thing I realize I'm kind of racing through this but then that's a problem I always end up speaking far too quickly so I do apologize but what we've been looking at other things are space and what I call space and deployment. The um, we have in the UAE here very very traditional layouts. Um, the students are sat in rows. Um, it's a smart board at the front of the classroom with a teacher's desk next to it, um, with a laptop or a desktop that's tethered to that desk. If you know what I mean, so you're, you're very much fixed in one position. The students are sitting in rows and. You know, it's, you know, it's a cliche, but the, the students that are interested sit at the front very often and the students that are less interested sit on the back. Unfortunately, a laptop can also be a fantastic thing to hide behind. You can, um, once the screen's up, put your mobile on the front of the screen and, and watch TikTok all lesson. And it looks like you're looking at a screen when you're not. It's very difficult to um, get the students to interact or to interact with the students. It's also if um, any of you have any um, language teaching background, I'm not sure. It's something that we were always told, particularly a language learning situation, never ever to do. And then what we've gone and done is created this situation where essentially we've got islands of students, even though they're sat in rows, but they're, they're sat individually behind a laptop in their own little world. And it's very difficult to get any communication going on. So. One of the solutions, and it, this really isn't something new, it was, I've also sort of called this a return to pedagogy in some ways, because when I did my initial teacher training, it was always students were never allowed to sit in rows. At the very least, they had to sit in pairs. And part of this then started appealing to me theoretically as well, because it goes back to the idea of having a more knowledgeable other as a tool. In any group of language learners, people, or any group of students, I would guess, people have different strengths. So you might put two students together, one who's better at vocabulary than another. One might be a better speaker than the other. One might be a better writer and so on. And these two students can then support each other and build more concrete knowledge by working together. And by putting them in pairs um, and in emphasizing that, we're hoping it's still early days and you'll see at the moment, I've still got um, some issues that I'm facing with that. Um, but this is what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get them away from the traditional rows and, and then sitting there isolated. And again, they've, 
I think there's an influence of COVID on this. These through their some very formative years, my students spent either online or in socially distanced classrooms. So they're not used to um, being close to people that they don't necessarily know um, or they're not, not used to working with. So this is one um, layout we were looking at. And another one um, is, you know, grouping the students. Um, again, nothing revolutionary here, but we'd, we'd forgotten this um, here in, um, in my institution. We weren't doing it. We were accepting the fact they were sat in rows and we we're accepting the fact they weren't talking to each other. So we've also tried other layouts, um, again, like U-shaped boardroom layouts, moving all the tables out to the side and not quite sitting on the floor, um, but you know, just, just trying to, to change the environment that they're sitting in, getting them out of that traditional um, classroom setting. They've already had maybe 12 years of that in their K-12 education, and then we're giving them the same when they come into college. So that I think it also reinforces some of perhaps the attitudes they've had to school. We're just reinforcing them by the environment that we're creating for them in the college. Now this, as I said, created a new contradiction because I would set my room up beautifully um, and then I'd go back the next day and everything would have magically um, returned to rows. And often this was down to the, the, the other teachers, um, not necessarily teaching the same subject as me, um, taking a more lecture-based approach, and they expected the classroom to be in rows. So they'd go in, be horrified that the students were sat in groups and immediately asked them to go back into rows. It might also have been, um, I know in one case, college management really didn't like it. And um, we had to explain to facilities why we kept moving all of their furniture around, um, which was a pleasant conversation. But of course, this could be frustrating because again, if you're going into class at the last minute, you don't want to spend half an hour arranging the furniture um, every day, which has made this, again, sort of, in, enforcing no actually practicing and, and really getting to grips with the idea of of changing the classroom round we've we've struggled with that a little bit um connected with this we made a big song and dance and i was as much part of it that we had a one-to-one -one deployment um by that i mean every single student in class had a laptop then in 2012, every single student in foundations across the country, all 14,000 of them, every single one of them had an iPad. And then in 2017, that went back to being laptops. But again, one-to-one -one deployment. And as I mentioned, what that's creating is just these individual islands where students are sat in there staring in a screen. I think there's something in 1984 about this. But, you know, being, being, they're, they're not engaging in a way in their environment even. So we thought, what about, let's try sharing screens. We've read some research on it. So we've been experimenting with, in their pairs, one student has a screen and the other one is closes their laptop. Um, we've also tried one to four ratios. We did try ratios of one to three and there was some research I'd read, um, I forget now who it was. I think it was Anderson perhaps, who had, he found that with the one to three um, ratio, so one laptop between three students, almost always one of those students becomes a passenger and stops participating. And the other two students would accept that. And so you'd, always, you'd only have two out of three people actually engaged and participating in what you were trying to do. This is something I wanna look more at. Um, I know in my own class, one to two works very well. One to four surprisingly um, is reasonably successful. And one to three, again, I, I need to look at it more carefully, but it, there does seem to be some, some truth in um, the observations that from the research I've read. However, as always, um, with anything you're trying to do, there's another contradiction, which is student resistance. As I mentioned, these students have gone through um, a K-12 system where they spend a long time online and or in socially distanced classrooms. And some of them, they don't like it. They don't like it if they're expected to work with another student. They don't like it if they're expected to share what they see as their personal um, machines, their personal devices. Um, they don't 
necessarily comprehend how it's helping them with learning a language or learning anything else. So there's a certain amount, I think, of learner training. And it's, again, something with my own classes I've been, I've had to introduce slowly. So in the, again, in the future, it's something I want to look at a bit more carefully and perhaps um, document it in more detail. So um, really, I'm, I'm getting towards the end of things. Um, this is where my sort of current research is um, and where I'm looking to move ahead into the next semester. So I really want to get beyond the sort of anecdotal and start getting some, some real meat together about how do interactive materials compare with simple documents when they're taught well? You know, are we wasting our time creating thousands of cahoots quizzes and interactive games and interactive exercises when really we should um, perhaps, you know, again, not getting rid of the laptops, keep mediating through that, keep using our learning management systems, but are we overdoing the interactivity? It's very impressive when we stand up in conferences or give training sessions or show management what we're actually doing in our English language classes, but is it actually effective? So um, that's one area. The second area is going back to the laptop and the mobile. I mean, it's, it's making best use of um, both devices that are in the classroom. And what device best suits an activity? The main issue um, at the moment, of course, it's, it's a lack of a policy on it, really. And it's in, occasionally we're told that it's absolute no, no, no laptops in, no, so no laptops, no mobiles in class. And depending who your particular management is at that time, they might, um, people might be criticized if, they, if they're seen allowing students to use laptops in, sorry, use mobiles in class. Um, it, it is an interesting dilemma that the mobile is not going to go away. And as I've said previously, I don't think prohibition is the answer. I mean, we all know um, prohibition doesn't work. Um, and the final thing is relating to space and deployment. And something I, I didn't really mention here is actually getting students out of the classroom and using devices as a real mobile learning device um, that they can use in other environments within a controlled, you know, the UAE has to be a controlled environment on a campus. We don't have the same freedoms as you might have in other areas, but we do have beautiful campus spaces that I don't think are being exploited. And I think, again, students will react very well to a, um, a different learning environment in the classroom and learning environments outside the classroom. And that's something we're not looking at enough, in my opinion. And of course, I tacked on the end, the big elephant in the room, where is, where is AI in all of this? Where is artificial intelligence? I'm sure everyone is coming up against it. Um, coming up against is the wrong word. I think we've got to learn, again, like the mobile phone or any of these things, we've got to learn how to embrace it. At the moment, there's perhaps a lack of policy and a lack of clear direction on that. But that's going to be a concurrent, that's going to be a theme that's running through everything I do, I think, for, um, for, the, for the foreseeable future. So it's something I'm going to have, have to add to my bio for the interest, but I am currently involved in some policy writing at a national level on that. So that's something else that I hopefully next year will be able to report back to you on. And as I said, I've kind of raced through that a bit um, and I do tend to speak very quickly. I hope you found it helpful or at least interesting. And I'll pass it back to Phil for the, for the next stage. Thank you. Super that. Thanks, Rob. What an insightful study. One of many that you've been involved with and super to see some of those traditional false dichotomies being confronted to like um, online, offline, digital analog, knowledge skills, you know. Um, please, if you wish to do so, uh, feel free to turn your cameras on, but we are being recorded, so please don't feel compelled to at all. If I could ask you, though, to offer some applause or recognition, new Zoom's digital representation of applause, if that suits you better, if that's more convenient. Thank you. Uh, it is time for some questions, if you wouldn't mind fielding, fielding some. Type them into the chat box there, or uh, feel free to raise a hand either um, digitally or using an analog means of an analog hand if you'd like that. Um, we will get some 
from the audience. I know that. So I've got a few, Rob, but I'm going to uh, keep those and defer to the audience. Uh, let me just see. Ah, somebody's got their hand up here, Rob, and that's somebody called Brett Bly. Let's see what Brett Bly's going to ask about. Would you like to ask? Yeah, Brett? So, thanks, Rob, for a really interesting presentation. I mean, you'll probably know that I know rather more about activity theory in the change lab than I do about uh, laptop mediated classrooms or English language learning. I, I actually have several questions, but I'm going to do is like ask one and then let's see if I get the chance to come back again in a bit. I have a list of about three. The first question was actually your your presentation um, focused quite a lot on uh, the final analysis, as it were. You know, these were the contradictions that we as a group um, decided were the contradictions in our classroom. I wonder if you could say something about the process. So I'm going to assume that this isn't anything like the usual way of working to address problems in this institution, both in terms of part practitioners having to come together to even decide what the problem is, um, in terms of not taking knowledge from somewhere else, but developing it yourself. And also in terms of, to some extent, being asked to grapple with technical philosophical activity theory kind of terminology right so how did it go how did people respond to being asked to go through this kind of process in that setting the actual participants were were very keen although they did struggle with the theoretical element of it so as the sort of researcher interventionist i was kind of having to in many terms retrofit um the theory onto what they were talking about you know i've got a great quote somewhere from uh, one of the teachers where he sort of says like oh yeah all those bloody triangles you kept waving at us um in terms of activity theory diagrams but it, i think the teachers you know the teachers the participants responded to it very very well i've since um i've been sounding out some people higher up as well and i've got a good ally i think who i'm hope hoping to be able to work with um next year um, who's who's in a position where you can get me to work with different departments and different um, sort of different groups of people. The group of people I was working with, I knew fairly well. So I think they were, you know, they were comfortable doing it partly because they knew me. I wasn't, I was an insider sort of change laboratorist rather than someone coming in from outside. And I think that definitely helped the process. The, um, it wasn't all smooth sailing, of course. It's, the, the main challenge I say for for one person to do it is it's a massive amount of work. And I was trying to do it within two week cycles between the things. So having to sort of analyze everything, prepare the next session, um, have a day job, um, you know, talk to my wife and kids occasionally and, you know, sort of go out now and again and, and um, enjoy myself. It was that, that's, that's a big, a big challenge. But as I say, in terms of the actual process, I think it engages people. They like, being given that um, autonomy to say we think this is the problem because that again in this inst institution that never happens no one ever comes to you at the front line and says why do you think this is happening someone stands up and says this is why it's happening and it's probably your fault so they they did respond well to it i hope no one was listening to me outside <laughs> Uh, Phil, I think you're still muted. Never gets old. Thanks, Rob. Um, I think you'd be all right. Just say it was coming through the speakers if anybody questions what they were hearing there, Rob. Um, did you have a, I don't, I don't want to, um, I don't want you to feel missed out there, James. Did you have a question you wanted to ask directly? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Brilliant. Thanks. Um, just to say that that fantastic talk really resonated very much with my last kind of decade and a half. Um, I, I mean, there's, I could ask you hundreds of questions and again, I don't want to completely hog the Q and A. So I'll, I'll make an observation first, which is actually your discussion that devices just get loaded onto schools. Here's some iPods, here's some laptops without anybody clearly saying exactly what they're there to solve and what they're to do 
but without the kind of backing to say this is actually how they help is is very resonant you know it looks good for schools to say we've got laptops for everyone or ipods but it doesn't necessarily say what they're doing with them but my my question it's about the context because your your talk very much focused on the devices and the learners but you've got all kinds of things around which actually feed into this as well i wonder how you're going to capture this so for example um you know the network may just not work so how do you cope with the kind of technical issues how do you cope with students who are not necessary because this whole digital natives thing is a bit of a misnomer as well kids are not always that good at the it side of things and then there's government policy so obviously where you are it seems that they're very much backing and they're putting a lot of money into devices in this country you know there used to be a thing in the Ofsted descriptions that said um, makes good use of new technology now that quietly came out of the Ofsted descriptors in about 2016-17 so it's it's also so you've got technological and kind of social and then skill things which you know I don't know how you're going to capture that in in your next stage of your study was that a clear enough question yeah, I think I think um, I think I, I get what you, you you mean. Is the the, in, the issue with infrastructure wasn't a problem. The UAE um, will throw a lot of money at a problem, yeah. and they'll basically say you're going to fix this, and they'll look, you know. So I mean, when we had the iPad initiative, I mean, I basically didn't have any leave that year. Had to come back early. We put together a training program for teachers, a training program for students. We had all the IT guys and the tech guys, you know, putting in, you know, fast, effective. Um, reliable Wi-Fi um, and, you know, Apple TVs into every um, classroom so that we could reflect um, the iPads onto the, the screens. In the end, um, it was very much learning by doing. The big problem we had was the kind of workflow aspect. It's like, how do you get work to the students? And how do you get back work, work back from the students? That's where the learning management systems came in. Um, yeah, there's a sort of control thing with the apps as well, isn't there? You know, suddenly a teacher finds an app they really want to use, but how do you make sure that's available to the right kids? Where's the app? You know, even fundamental things like has the school or institution got access to the app store? And if you end up with loaded devices before you quite know what you're doing with them, you end up starting from right near the end when actually you need to start a bit near the beginning. Yeah, that was a that definitely was a problem. And I think, you know, over the years we've sort of, it's why I think one of the problems with app fatigue is because we've kind of honed it down to sort of maybe like five or six things that everybody uses because everyone can access them. We know they work well. Um, but then the problem is it's like, it's fine if I'm your only teacher because I will vary it. But if you're walking out, of, if you've just done a Kahoot, for example, in my class, and then you walk into Brett's class and he's doing a Kahoot, and then you walk into Philip's class and he's doing a Kahoot, you start to lose patience with it. So... So yeah, I mean these were these were challenges we faced, but it's it's less of an issue now with the laptop, and because we've got you know a very sort of solid foundation of um, basic materials that we do deliver, and the course has been fairly sta stable for a while. And again, I think you know we've the teachers are. I mean, I always say to the people um, that I work with that we think what we do is every day, but we're really quite cutting edge in terms mm -hmm. of the skills we've developed. You know dealing in these you know these um laptop mediated classrooms can i carry on for a minute is that right why me yeah please do so the, the mobile phone thing i couldn't agree more there's no point in fighting that that's a that's a stable door on a horse if students engage with the world through their mobile phones you need to find a way of making that relevant um and so perhaps i'll, I'll back to my original question which is this government would very much like to ban phones in schools that, that will create all kinds of behaviour management issues for school leaders because it's, it's as you say, completely impossible. So my, my last question perhaps was about the, you know, the really big picture. The government in this country are not that keen on spending the money to improve the infrastructure, to provide the devices. It's often, you know, very enthusiastic schools or whatever. So you're, you're looking at a particular context. What do you think about the big picture internationally? Is this getting in everywhere or why is Britain falling behind in this? I think it's um you know it's it's kind of institutional and governmental will perhaps you know the 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 UAE really wants to be at the forefront of this at the vanguard of it and so they're insisting on it the mobile phone thing um hasn't been solved but you know schools themselves are still you know one to one devices and they they backed it up with 
you know, kind of paperless environments. And they, you know, they're giving you the support, they're giving you the infrastructure, the will is there, the finance is there, and the means are there. And that's why they're, they're able to push it through, I think. I think that's what's lacking in, in um, other countries or institutions. Thanks. I'll stop hogging the questions now, but it was fascinating to listen to you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Appreciate it. You're all right, James. It's, it's good to ask. Um, and the, to be honest, they're not coming in thick and fast on the chat, so uh, please do feel free. Um, I'm just going to ask you something about the um, maybe the, na the notion of sort of constellations of artifacts might relate to what James was saying, actually. So I suppose a key thing of every change lab is working out that the, the problem probably isn't what you originally thought it was about, to use Brett's um, turn of phrase. And it seems that that could have been that could have been about laptops, and then at some point it could also have been about um, maybe how people feel that technology is being done to them. And then at another point, it could have also been about furniture or balancing a socially constitutive space, along with who decides what socially constitutive is without drifting into, to use your phrase, 1984 type direction on, you know, yeah. this is the reason we're having this layout, it's so that you all enjoy it, right? Um, yeah. That kind of thing. Well, I suppose while concurrently trying to engender resistance, which is key to this methodology you're using. Um, so artifacts don't act on their own. They, you know, there's space in there and that's not sterile. I think he used the term space and deployment. I also think that we quite often make the mistake of we say technology and we focus solely on digital. And there's quite a lot of things like chairs and as you said, pens, whether they're into the equation or out of the equation, that they're relevant in some way, otherwise they wouldn't have been removed. Um, and, you know, school bells and things like that. So in terms of that whole kind of constellation of mediating artifacts, how, how, how on earth do you look at those future plans that you've got, Rob? What are you going to do? I suppose to bound some unit of analysis so that you can meaningfully research it, but also recognise that they act in constellation. Yeah, it's um, this is the whole thing with with a change lab. It, you know, again, what attracted me to it. I mean, I've been, as I've mentioned, I was part of the iPad initiative and very, very gung ho about it. Um, the decision came from the government, but when they said in the institution we need someone to run that project team, you know, I and they they asked me, I was all for it, um, and very, very top down, very, you know, jumping in with both feet. Um, and again, it was that kind of thing. You will use it or else in some cases, I think, you know, without without being, you know, not being necessarily like that myself, but that we weren't really given any, any choice in the matter. So to have a change lab and, and to go into that from the bottom up and not really knowing where it was going to go was fantastic. Now, what it does do is it generates so much data. You know, I've got data upon data upon data that I found I just had to sort of focus on areas that my gut just said I was perhaps either more interested in or, or more likely to to look at. So as I say at the moment, I've 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 got it down to those three areas. Yeah. There are still four main areas. And I think those three areas I think kind of into you know our constellations, they they interweave in some way. But again, it's all interrelated. And this is where it becomes that kind of infinity question of and you know at some point you just have to I think focus on a point a bit as much as you can. I know other people might be better at looking at the sort of wider interactivity. I think for me personally, I'm probably better at a, a sort of closer in focus. Yeah, okay. So the, I suppose a change lab is a journey, not a destination or something like that, isn't it? So, uh, yeah. I mean, just before we bring Brett back in, because I know he's itching to um, ask you a few things. If In terms of the top down having not worked properly, uh, so clearly rich ground for a bottom up approach. Um, I mean, we, we do need at some point to set up those oscillations. Do, it, it, were they just naturally oscillating because there'd been so much top down stuff before you came along? Is is that what you're suggesting then? Yeah, I mean, there's one of the major contradictions um, that I pulled out. And again, we something I want to look at you know, again, in more detail, but I need to go back and refocus on it. It's this thing I called the mysterious they. I suddenly noticed participants kept talking about, well, they did this and they did that. And because I was in um, a management position for a while, 
I'd know sometimes where who the they was, but it was interesting to see that the the participants had this sort of perception of this they that that could include everyone from you know an immediate line manager to a college director to an executive dean to a government minister to somebody that was perhaps fairly nebulous or you know it was more a, a combination of those things and that in itself was a was a major source of of was a major contradiction particularly among the the subjects so again something to investigate but in in this context perhaps a little bit more difficult to do so it's something i might look at using um social media contact contacts and try to look at it more internationally to um there's obviously local political considerations I'd have to bear in mind. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, Brett. Um, okay, so I'm gonna it's to some extent what I'm gonna say is a devil's advocate kind of question, but I've found it useful to think like this myself in the past. So when you go through a change lab for you, okay, it's a lot of work, but it's also very rewarding, right? Absolutely. It also tends to be most of the time actually quite revolutionary in the local context okay yeah. so, so you get very swept up into it and i find that by the end of a change lab people are talking very much in terms of um how swept up in it they got and how brilliant it was and how revolutionary it was and i realize that for other people who don't go through this process or who listen to somebody like you moan about how they didn't get to speak to their wife enough or something like that, they start to think of questions like, was it worth doing all of that work? And I've started to realize that you kind of need to be answering questions like, there's probably two sides to this. One is, is the knowledge that you produced different from the knowledge that's already dominant in the literature on this kind of topic? Have you produced new kind of knowledge, you know, that you couldn't have just read in a paper already? And the other side of it is, have you produced knowledge that you couldn't have got by just, I don't know, sending out a questionnaire and saying, what's what do we need to do next? You know, to what extent do you think in essence, I mean, I, I tend to use this kind of phrase from Rosa Luxemburg, people who don't move don't notice their chains, right? So we, and you've used Marx's phrase about the point of the world is to change it so that we can, um, among other things, learn about the world. Do we learn or did you learn, do you think, by going through this process, anything that couldn't have been learned in an easier way? Um, yeah, I, I think it's the very nature of the involvement that's necessary from the researcher interventionist and the participants. That in itself, I mean, perhaps it's a character thing, um, but I find that necessary. I don't, I, I, I tend not to do anything half-assed if, if you'd excuse the language perhaps, but I tend to throw myself into things and I'm, I'm not a faddist in the, you know, I'm not the kind of person who goes out and spends 3000 pounds on golf clubs and then gives up a month later. You know, if I'm, if I'm into something, I tend to be into something. If I commit, I commit. And a, a change lab, you know, you really are committing theoretically. You're committing in terms of the time and the effort that you're going you're gonna to put in. And it's the fact that you don't know where that knowledge is, what the knowledge is going to be at the end, that it is a journey of discovery. And I think even if, even if you get to the end and perhaps you haven't necessarily found anything that revolutionary, you've gone through a process of getting there. Like, I don't know, for example, if it's just, you know, if um, it's like, well, how do we move that rock? And then we might go through lots of different ways of, of doing it and then found out the best way to do it is actually still a JCB. But we went and we looked at different ways. We tried out different ways. And it's the whole, the process and the the empowerment and the autonomy that you give to those people, the, the, the work team, the people that are involved in the change lab itself, that is a massive value. Again, rather than saying, get the JCB is like, well, how, would, how else could we do it? Why don't we think about it? Because something may come out of that. There's absolutely no guarantee that what comes out of it is going to be, is going to be new, is going to be revolutionary in any way, but it might be. And that in itself is, is, is worth all of the effort. The fact I'm still, um, it still has legs. I'm still running with it. And this started four years ago. So um, that should say something. Yeah, can I just follow up on that? So that that that's an interesting answer. Um, I, by the way, started when I analysed change labs, actually looking at the knowledge they produced at the end, 
just to check whether they produced anything new. And it's incredibly rare that the answer is no. So I, I, I've actually kind of doubled down a bit on my view that this um, is worth that, is worth the amount of effort of the process. But it was interesting to pose the question to myself after I'd got asked it a few times and then stumbled over an answer. So that was part of it. Now, I'm interested just at what you said at the end. I have got a book chapter in press, which has already got a bit of debate going on around it, where what I did was to map a typical change lab as an activity system. And then there was this entire question, is a change lab really a separate activity system? Shouldn't it just be a set of actions that arises within an existing activity system? And my answer to that is, I think that a lot of change labs develop legs of their own. They start from a from a set of contradictions in existing activity. But in the end, they almost never end. Like once you set this kind of engine going and start to empower people, even if the research project ends, some trace of the change lab goes on forever as its own kind of activity and its own kind of logic. And it was one of the other questions I had in mind to ask you, but I didn't know if we'd have time. But you've almost posed it yourself. So you're still, and actually you're not the only one who's done this kind of thing. I, you're still doing this like years after the PhD's ended. It's still got a life of its own, right? Is that is that fair to say? Or would you agree that yeah, absolutely. it's its own entity? It does, absolutely. I mean, I, I, I been th I think along similar lines as well that, you know, that a change laboratory as an activity becomes its own activity system and spins off into other activity systems almost. And interestingly, I, I, um, I saw one of the participants recently socially and he actually said that, you know, it was great that the social distancing rules had finally been relaxed because he had students sitting in pairs and threes and was and was trying the closing the laptops thing. Um, and sharing screens and stuff like that. I find a lot of people now, uh, you know, this, it's spun out um, because, again, it wasn't me standing up in a conference and saying, use the mobile as a secondary device. But lots and lots of, um, it's because, it, you know, we had sort of eight or 10 people involved, they've gone out and it's spread from there. We actually had a bit of a problem on one campus because um, a visiting higher up was walking around and, was very unhappy to see all these students on mobiles in in classrooms and we had to defend that and point out that they were using them as second screens they were using them to translate yes some of them were on whatsapp or tiktok but far fewer of them than would have been normally and and again you don't have the classroom management issues that you know james um mentioned it's it they definitely develop legs of their own they'll definitely run and i th and for that very reason i mean you know I mean, you, I'm, I'm talking to a convert and, um, and you know yourself, I'm very, very interested in the, the whole, um, the whole thing. So, so yeah, I, in answer to your question, yes, definitely. It's an activity system in itself that spins off into other activity systems and they, they run and they run. I think it's, you, they, in many ways, you're kind of recreating just this, this, you know, you're forcing expansive learning, which is a natural thing anyway, I think. Thank you. I suppose if you <clears throat> flip the argument of logic around the other way, if it's a straightforward question, you wouldn't do a change laboratory, would you? If you kind of already had a really well-framed question and problem and there didn't seem to be any ambiguity, you probably wouldn't embark on a change lab. I'm not sure if you'd be able to engender the, <laughs> uh, what the question in and analytical stuff, could you? Um, it's probably worth just stating um, for anybody listening to the recording that if you are considering doing a change lab, please do keep considering doing a change lab. It's not always drudgery of carrying on and trying to find the motivation to keep going. They are incredibly rewarding. And yeah, I should I should say that. I mean, I, I always go on. Yeah, it's a daunting amount of work, but it's it's really worth it. Um, yeah. It's, it, you know, you, and it is very, very rewarding. And as you see the participants, you know, I was doing this with a group of English teachers and they're the, the worst possible people to try to work with as groups very often because they tend to be very independent. They're used to having total control of what they do in the classroom. Um, so then sort of coming in and, and then giving them control of the situation and watching sort of eight, nine, ten individuals coming together in this and, and, and going through and, splintering off and coming back together it's um it, it's fascinating and as your insights come out as you 
as you move ahead and that not knowing you know you're not you're not sort of you're not going out saying right i've got a a theory that i want to prove you know i've got a that sort of a hypothesis that i want to test yeah. it's it's kind of like well we there's a problem i think they'll identify what the problem is it's going to be it'll come out to be things you may not have thought of and then we try to solve that you may not solve them you may go off in a totally different direction and then a new model will develop that you might you weren't expecting and that that's very worthwhile i think doing yeah i mean a lot of change laboratorians they'll kind of um i say a lot you know the, the ones i know um, they'll kind of share stories about how all encompassing they can be when you're involved in them but it's a, you know it's an incredibly positive thing for all those oscillations and it can become almost all about that methodology can't it from when you get up to so when you go to bed that night in some cases um and you know your your thoughts are kind of occupied by this certainly a um you know an expansive change on the world so um we've got time for another couple or three questions but just to provide a segue towards the end um you mentioned that there are some future possibilities uh, is there anything kind of right on the horizon in the near term Rob you know what what's kind of the very next thing for you well what I'm hoping um to do is well at the, the moment to be honest I'm, I'm tied up in a big um, policy writing project but that should finish hopefully in um in the, the coming month what I would really like to do and I, I think I've got the support for it um higher up is to run another change lab but about teacher training as I mentioned, we have um, mandated uh, professional development hours. Um, some of these are mandated by the government. Some of them are mandated by the institution. And I'm as bad as my students. So I'm clicking until everything goes green if they're interactive activities. Very little is going in. I think it would be interesting to run a change lab sort of around, you know, how people, you know, again, it's still quite embryonic, but, you know, how you know, how a group of faculty would develop their own sort of training program that would go throughout an academic year. What do they think they need? How would it be delivered? Except, I don't want to put too much on it. Um, it's... We'll take a question. I think the last one probably from Brett and then we'll tie a bow around it all if that's okay. Uh, well, this is more a suggestion than anything else. I mean, what I'm getting interested in is the relationship between the change lab and the rest of the institution in which the change lab is happening how could you map that i mean it could be mapped as an activity network right um but that that's a broader project and i think that that's something that we need to think more about and one thing that we do assume is that somehow the project leader gets support from somebody in the institution and then somehow it happens and the rest of it's just magic or maybe it's all voluntary unpaid labor or something like that. Um, I was reading a paper in the last months that was in a university and it was in Costa Rica and they were doing a change lab with maths academics who were trying to reshape maths teaching in this university in Costa Rica. And one of the key things there was about professional development. One of the magic steps they were able to do at the beginning when they had an enormous problem with recruiting anybody was to say, well, just like you're facing, academics have to do a lot of professional development hours each year. And they negotiated with the management of the university that participating in the change lab would be recognized PD hours itself. And suddenly they had loads of participants and suddenly people willing to devote time to it. And the change lab produced great results. But that was like a, a magic thing they did at the beginning, which I would have never thought of. And it kind of takes into account those relationships, you know, like somewhere in the institution is a rule producing activity that's going to influence the change lab. Right. So, you know, you could maybe go and negotiate with that first. So it's an idea, but also an intellectual interest of mine of, well, actually, the change lab's got to fit within the existing institutional fabric of activity systems. It's actually something I was able to do with my change lab. Um, uh, I was able to negotiate that we were able to say this was going to be X number of hours. Um, and that meant, you know, I was at least able to get people interested we had an initial meeting um that let's say like 12 people turned up to the initial meeting and four of them weren't interested um but then i had another couple come in who heard about what was going on 
and were interested, you know, from the second-hand information they'd got. But it was a definite advantage having at least that level of institutional support to be able to say, you know, yes, it will be recognised. Because there's there is a certain amount of commitment. Um, obviously, you've got to put people into it, and people aren't going to do it um, just for the love of it, unfortunately. Um, and especially initially, while they're still perhaps finding their feet, as they get involved in it and it sort of draws them in, the fact that they're getting PD hours for it becomes very much a secondary thing. But I think, you know, to, to get the recruitment for people, you need to be able to offer some kind of carrot. Um, you need to be able to get them involved in some way. So another opportunity, another thing might be, you know, to get, if you're in an academic environment, perhaps to, that people themselves, the participants could use it as an opportunity for a bit of a research um, thing on, in themselves, how their, own, how their own experience has been of the of the change lab. Another thing I was thinking would be interesting would be to run a change lab and to be observed, you know, by somebody else running that change lab, you know, to have any, you know, someone observing how that change lab is happening. I think a bit like you were, you were sort of a direction you're perhaps thinking yourself, but uh, yeah. Would you want that to be an activity theorist, Rob? Or? Would be interesting to have another take on it, another look at it. Um, but I think for my own personal interest, I'd like it to be another activity theorist because I'd like it to be explained in activity theory terms. Because um, I think there'd be it would just be the, the, the sort of neutrality of having somebody else outside of it. I mean, yeah, I mean, you could get two, one activity theorist and one um confirmed non-activity theorists perhaps would be a an interesting take on it yeah you could get a positivist to some tape measures and stopwatches and <laughs> see what they thought of it. uh that was fantastic thanks very much we'll tie a, a bow around everything now please do keep these meaningful discussions going on your other channels please do follow the department for educational research on x twitter on YouTube uh, and everywhere else. Uh, last but not least, thank you as ever to Dee and Rebecca who make these events happen and keep them running and put up with me. Um, before you leave, we do have a break for a few weeks, but please remember to meet up again in 2023. Please do record the date of the next online seminar, which will be on uh, Wednesday, the 24th of January. 2024 that will be presented by uh, Jessica Ren Butler who's at the Centre for Higher Education Research and Scholarship at Imperial College London not to be missed thanks again everyone lovely to see you all and we'll see you again soon cheerio <laughs>